Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Awesome. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here. Thank you for just being so faithful to us and always true and always just there for us. Thank you for being present with us because you're an ever-present help in the time of trouble. So we thank you for that. In the mighty name of Yeshua, amen. Amen. What does Yeshua mean? It means Jesus. What does Jesus mean? God's salvation. What is that word God in Hebrew means I am. It's Yahweh's salvation. I am salvation. So whoever calls on the name of Yeshua is saved because he is salvation. And so that salvation isn't just like, oh man, I'm saved, so now I can go to heaven one day, right? (laughs) Woohoo, you know, we'll party when we get there, but until then, you're on your own, boys, you know? That kind of stink, but it's more like when God talks about His shalom. The Bible says that God, He's a peace that passes understanding, but it says Jesus is a peace that breaks down every wall. So what is that? What are they saying? He's the completeness. He's the nothing missing, the nothing broken in our life that is breaking down every wall, everything that you're facing that looks like it's impossible. He's the one that, man, takes care of that. In Him, we're just singing the song, um, His name is a strong tower, right? The Bible says that the righteous run into it and they are saved. Literally, I am salvation hung on a cross for us and died with it, died for us. And we in Him, in, in a lot of ways, we died with Him, right? Because the Bible says that we are crucified with Christ Therefore, we no longer live, but it's He that lives inside us. So He took all our sin, all our pain, all of our suffering, and now we get to let Him live His life through us, which is a great hope, right? It's almost like like that's a little early for Resurrection Sunday, Pastor James. But hey, every day should be Resurrection, right? And so we should celebrate Jesus every day and know that He's with us. And so it made me think about sometimes we go through bitter stuff in the waters. You ever think like, man, I'm drinking from this well of life and it's a little bit bitter. It happened to the Israelites when, when they were in the desert. Do you know what God said? He said, suck it up, boys. This is as good as it gets. Remember how bad that Nile water tasted, especially when I turned it into blood? Right? That's what he said, right? No. What did he say? He's like, Moses, I want you to take a piece of wood and I want you to throw it in the bitter waters. And when they did, you know what happened? the water became sweet. Now, what was that? That was, in a way, God was setting us up for Jesus, right? Everything in this book that God has is setting us up for Jesus, who is our salvation, who is God with us, right? Emmanuel, right? God with us. Isn't that awesome? So they threw the the wood into the bitter water, and what happened? It becomes sweet. And so that tells us when... Then when they were going through the, through the desert and, and they were complaining and grumbling to God and so, so all these snakes started coming up and then biting them, what happened? God said he set, put a pole and on it he put a serpent. And that serpent represented the curse, right? And so Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, if I be lifted up, he referred to that in John. We quote John 3.16 a lot, right? that he's talking to Nicodemus, right? He's a scholar who's wanting to know, a Hebrew scholar wanting to know about Jesus. And he couldn't quite grasp the spiritual stuff that God was talking about. He didn't even believe what Jesus was telling him on the earthly things. And Jesus like, if you don't trust me on the earthly things, how are you ever going to trust me in the spiritual things? But he said, if the Son, if I be lifted up, I'll draw him in unto me. But unless he's lifted up like Moses in the desert, lifted up the serpent on a pole, he's saying, guess what? I will become a curse for you so that you don't have to be a curse. And so what happened is they would go when they get snake bit and anyone would come up there and they'd look upon the pole. And you know what would happen? Nothing. 
Actually, some of them would go dancing around it, and that's where they went, no. No. You know what? They got healed. Because they, they beheld him. And so, though, this book all through it is, is um, scattered with hints and senses of Jesus. Even from the very beginning, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it says, in the beginning, a leif tov. God just throws that in there, man. You know who a leif tov is? Jesus said, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Do you know what he was saying? In Greek, that's um, A and Z, right? Or in Hebrew, it would be, I'm the Aleph and I'm the tov. And so he's in there from the very beginning, and so, even in Holy Bible, right? Because you go, hey, that's Kadesh, right? And so, so you get a hey in there, right? So there's like, anyway, I'm going to go on. <laughs> right, but he's in there. And if we keep, if we do anything else but point to Jesus and his finished work, we're going to go veering off. And when we veer off, we're going to go, if, we're, if we forget his work, then we end up relying on our own works. In our own works, the Bible says that our righteousness, he says our best, our very best is as filthy rags. Man, if our very best is filthy rags, man, what's our worst like? And so we veer off and then we're trying to do our own works and depending on our own self and our own self don't work. And that's what I've learned. Like, I've tried to ever get in this place where you're trying to fix everything, and no matter what you do, it's just like something that it doesn't work out or go your way. And then you realize, wait a second, I'm trying to do this on my own. Like, God, what's your plan? How do you want to work this out in my life? And do you know what God does? He gives me an ideal, or he brings a, a solution to me. Why? Because he's like, I don't want you to lean on your own understanding. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with some of your heart. The other part, depend on yourself. Right? With how much of your heart? can't be all your heart. You need part of your heart to worry. Right? And to freak out. Right? I've got to, I was like, that didn't work last time, so I'm going to freak out this time. Right? Don't you ever see those hearts that are like, they take one piece and you got the other? God can have this half, but I'm keeping this one. Right? We do that. Am I the only one who does that? No. And God's like, no, give it to me. And I'll weld that together and meld that together. And then you'll have, you can trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then not leaning on your understanding. Why? Because we're just like Nicodemus. We have a hard time trusting God on things that are here on the earth. What, how are we ever going to trust him on the more spiritual level? If we can't trust him in the basic sense. And so God wants us to take him at his word and to trust him in ways that, that, that um, no one else sees or hears or feels, you know, and go on a different level. Have a relationship with him that is above and beyond what anyone else has. I remember Moses another time, right? They're, they're in the desert and they, they're thirsty. And so all the Israelites are like, you brought us out here to die. That was their favorite saying. You brought us out here to die. Like, like I've done that. Like, I've done that recently. You've got, you've got me into this mess, God, you know? And he, it, sometimes God's blessings aren't as pretty as you think. <laughs> sometimes you've got to go through some stuff. Sometimes you've got to trust him. They were set free and walk into freedom, but in the process of it, we get to learn to trust God. One thing I've learned over the last year or so is you've got to trust God, right? Even when you're super blessed, even when things are going your way, Sometimes going through seasons, you can't depend on man. You've got to put your trust and hope completely on God and God alone. And when you do, do you know what he does? He makes a way. He's like, okay, I tell you what, if you want to work, I'll rest. Like, wait a second, that's not how I want to do it, right? And he's like, but if you want to rest, I'll work. And then I can put my trust and my hope in you and watch you. Because, like, he can do a whole lot more than I can do. Right? And so here they're complaining. And they like to complain. I like to complain, too. I mean, like, I, sometimes I do. I'm learning. I'm learning to gauge how I talk. 
because I don't, and you're like, well, Pastor James, that's blabbing and grab it. No, I will talk about, there are certain things I need to talk about how I feel, but there's other things I need to find out what does God say about the situation. And then instead of saying what I feel, what I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, I'm going to say, God, what do you say about that? And then I stand on that instead of what I'm feeling. That's where they were. God said, I'm taking you to the promised land. He didn't say, I'm going to take you in a private jet <laughs> with, with luxury. He didn't even give them Rolls Royces or anything. They had to walk, right? We get to walk. That's why it's called the walk of faith, man. And so we get to walk out our and grow in God and work out our salvation. Our salvation is complete, but we get to work it out. Our salvation in every area is already a done deal to God, but we get to work it out. And we're not working it out on his behalf. We're working it out on our behalf because of how we think and how we things we've gone through and the paradigms we thought. God's not the problem. He's the solution. And if, we, if we'll learn to trust him, He'll take us through, but they're complaining. It's not like going like they're wanting. So instead of saying, okay, Father, how are you going to how are you gonna provide for me now? Look, I've seen you turn turn the river to blood, man. I've seen, seen you bring us out of slavery. I've seen the Red Sea depart. Man, they've seen more miracles than anybody up to their point. And still, when it get hard, they go back to that slave mentality. Well, it's not about what, I, what God says. It's about what I see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. The Bible says we walk by our senses and our sight and our hearing. Right? And that's what the Bible says, right? Because that's logical, right? Those are, those are our, our facts. It's truth. It's reality, right? No. It might be a fact. But truth trumps fact every time. And the truth is what God's word. In fact, the truth isn't just a, an ideal, but it's a person. And his name's Yeshua. His name's Jesus. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So we find that in Yeshua. Not, not in things, not in ideals, but in him. And in him alone. In him we live and move and have our being and it frees us, right? So here they're complaining and, and Moses and Aaron are like, oh man, we gotta turn to God. So they go to the go and they lay down in front of the Ark of the Covenant and God says, I want you to go and I want you to speak to the rock. You know what Moses did? He got mad. And instead of just speaking, he took his staff, he took his rod and he struck the rock twice now God did tell him to strike the, the Nile River he had him hold the rod out over the Red Sea but at this time Moses is like you know what no I've had it with these people and so he strikes the rock and you know what water come out of it but guess what that wasn't the way God intended it right and here's a lot of the, we use the rod to beat people up a lot of times. And you know what the rod is? It's God's authority. It's God's power. And we're taking it and we're striking people with it. And God's wanting us to speak life into people. So here Moses is mad. It cost him and Aaron both being, getting to enter the promised land. Why? Because they were misusing the power of God. The rod represents... Number one, I, one of the greatest, um, one of the greatest um, definitions that I heard was it's a power of truth. When you have that, that's a power of truth. You got the Bible says it says your rod and staff they will cause me discomfort. They will comfort me, right? Why would that? Like I always think people, well, I'm going to get the rod and I'm going to hit them with it. And like they don't even. That's not what it was for. The rod was, was to guide sheep. And the staff was about power and truth and authority. Guess what? Remember when Esther, we're coming up on Purim next month, right? Which is a Jewish holiday. She went before the king and he had to put out his golden scepter. What is it talking about? Gold represents righteousness and the, and the staff represents the power of truth. So it was God's righteousness and his power of truth when she came to him. And God set them free because she had 
the courage to do what God asked her to do, but that king had it, and that's why kings carry the staff. Now, you also see, like, like the world will kidnap that, so you'll see a lot of musicians, uh, not musicians, magicians. I know some musicians <laughs> might carry them, too, because they're just like, have to. Maybe it's cool or something. I don't know. But, but like Merlin and all these things in fiction, they had a, a staff, too. What is it? It's it's because it like the enemy can't create, but he can duplicate. He's a counterfeiter, right? So, but it represents power. It represents truth. And so we have power in God's authority. But God said, you know something? I want you to speak to that rock. And water come out. Like now, get this. It wasn't like us here or our families, or even like this community here, there were millions of people. Like water gushed out. Not only were there millions of people, there was livestock, man. You know how much water livestock drink? I do, because I'm feeding a bunch of them and watering a bunch of them. They eat and drink a lot. That the water gushes out, and it watered them and satisfied them. Now, I keep thinking of that song, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Man, that river is Jesus. That water is Jesus. When he was at the woman at the well, he goes, I have water you don't know nothing about. He's like, dude, I'm at the well. He's like, but I am the well. Will you drink from me? Will you drink from my hope? Will you drink from my peace? Will you drink from who I am? And I'll do great things in your life, right? So they struck it instead of speaking to it. And it taught me a lot listening to that because I was like, you know something? We can, we need to be careful how we look at things, right? We hear, well, uh, you don't be a blab it and grab it. I'm not, not being a blab it and grab it. I want to say what God says. What do you say about this situation rather than what does my circumstances say? And with that, I'm going to segue, and it, that means I'm going to switch over to the scripture, which is not a segue. It's going to fit in. A segue, I think, is one of those little things you write. <laughs> is that what those, you ever see those things? And it's just like, never mind. So then 2 Kings, I'm going to give you the gospel from 2 Kings. Okay? So, in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8. I love this. Chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, One day Elisha went to, Sh to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put, it in, a, put in it a bed and a table, a chair, and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. Now, there's something really cool I like about this because here, here's Elisha. He's a prophet of God. God called him. God anointed him. And this woman recognized that God was in Elijah and was working with Elijah and working through Elijah and doing all these great miracles. So she says, you know what? I might need a miracle in my life, or even if I don't, I want to make room for God in my house. And so do you know what she did? She did exactly that. She made room for him. Remember when Jesus was born, there was no room in the inn, so he had to go to the stable? She didn't send him to the stable. She didn't send Elisha. This wasn't even Jesus, like Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God being born. This is a prophet. This is Elisha. And she says, I'm going to make room. Are we making room in our lives, in our homes? Are we preparing a place for God? Are we preparing a place for his promises? Are we making room for that? One of the things that, that one of my mentors always talked about was if you need something and like you got a bunch of clothes in your closet and you don't really need them give them away he's like don't even go to get like he's like don't even like have garage sales he's like give them away and goes when you do 
you created a space where God can bless you back. And so I've done that, man. I've done that. I'm doing that right now because like all my clothes felt started looking like tents. <laughs> so I walk around and get like walking and then I trip in my own britches or my own shirt because it's like, like a dress. They're like, Pastor, when did you start wearing dresses? I was like, this isn't a dress. That's what I used to wear, right? So I had to give my, my yellow raincoat away too because everybody was like hollering at me. Oh man, you're scaring me. There's a truck driving by. <laughs> But, it's, but I made room. And sometimes if we make room, then God can fill that void. We're so afraid that we have to hang on to everything that we lose ourselves in it. Because what happens, our hope comes in that. Our hope goes into what we have instead of who we are and who He is. Does that make sense? And say, so, oh boy, I better hang on to this stuff because I might need it again. Or, oh boy, I might need to put this away instead of trusting God because he says, give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? We can trust him daily, right? But this woman made a place. That's not my message. I guess it's God's message, kind of, right? One day when Elisha came... He went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. I don't know how he got her phone number. <laughs> it doesn't say. And Elijah said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she replied, I have a home among my people. What can be done for her, Elijah asked. Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Okay, time out. Elijah's like, you know what? I want to see this woman blessed. How can I bless her? Well, she's well, she's got everything, man. Everything you could ever want. She's got a house, she's got... Her, her husband's rich. She's loaded. They've got their businesses. They've got their yachts and their jets. And, you know, they just got off of one of those episodes of, of Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, you know. And they had all this stuff, but they didn't have anyone to leave it to. And so they're trying to find out how do you bless someone who's blessed with everything. And they found that there was one thing she didn't have. She didn't have a son. She didn't have someone to carry on her legacy. And so Gehazi said, hey, she don't have a son and her husband's old and so there's no hope. I think we've read that in the Bible somewhere before this time too. Like she wouldn't have been here if God hadn't blessed Abraham and Sarah and then Isaac and Rebekah and so forth and so on. God's the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. There's things that look dead, that look hopeless, that look like there's no hope, and God says, I'm getting ready to breathe life into those things right now. Will you trust me with your life? Will you trust me with who you are and who I am in you? And so Gehazi, a servant, says, well, she has no son and her husband is old. And Elijah said, call her. So he got her phone out. I think it was an iPhone because they didn't allow the Androids back then. <laughs> they didn't know what Androids was, but they had apples. Okay, never mind. Then Elijah, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and none of the teams I like are in the Super Bowl, so I'm a little bit kind of squirrely. <laughs> like, why, why? I kind of want to watch. So now I'm rooting for teams that played for my Oklahoma Sooners. So, and they're on both sides. So I'm like, now what do I do? So I guess I'll watch a movie. I might watch the game too. Okay, so here, where was I at? So, oh yeah, then Elisha got his iPhone out and said, call her. So he called her. And she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, You will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O oh man of God. Do you know what he is? Calls her up and says, Hey, guess what? This time next year, you're going to have a son in your arms. He, even, he didn't even do a gender reveal 
after she got pregnant. Like there wasn't no blue powder and, and pink powder. He's like, I'm just telling you straight up, it's going to be blue. And you're going to have a son. And it's going to be this time next year. You will be holding that baby. You'll be holding that promise in your arms. And I tell you, it's not a coincidence that God's wanting us to talk through this this morning. Because there's promises that you have had that look like they're dead and that look like they're hopeless. And God is saying, by this time next year, you'll be holding that in your hands. Watch what I'm getting ready to do. Because I'm going to blow your socks off, man. He, they didn't wear socks back then, so that he didn't have to do that. But... On your case. Now watch. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. And then they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> right? The Disney princesses were dancing and the little little animals were coming out of the, you know, woods and they were singing their songs and like the end, right? You ever get a promise from God? And you think, oh, thank God, there's no more trouble now. Just like the Israelites were talking about them. They get out, out of Egypt, right? And they go from Egypt to the desert, man. They got a promise. God gave them life. He was taking them to the promised land. And he takes us to the promised land. That's why it's give us this day our daily bread. Right? What did they learn? That we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if that's true, I want to find out what God's saying. And the problem is, is when I grew up, it was always a bad God, a big bad God with a big bad stick that would go thumping you all the time. And that's not the God that I found. That's a false God. And in some ways, it's a false idol. Like, is that too real to preach that? I'm going to make some, someone somewhere is going to get mad at me, but it's the truth. And I ain't going to back away from it because I have a good father that loved me and gave his son for me. And I'm not worshiping any other God. That God that I grew up with that was a mean sucker, I don't want no part of that God. But I want my Heavenly Father, and I want to know Him in ways that, that I've never known Him before. You hear what I'm talking about? Now watch this. Are we going to trust Him? Are we going to find Him? Are we going to love Him? Are we going to put our hope in Him? Or are we going to put our hope on what we see here, taste, touch, and smell? Now watch. The child grew. And one day he went out to his father who was with the reapers. And he said, my head, my head, he said to his father. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon and then he died. Now remember, she didn't initiate this blessing. She didn't initiate this promise. In fact, when Elijah called, Elisha called her, she said, don't raise my hopes. Don't mislead me. Why? Because this was something that was on her heart that she wanted, that she longed for, that she had a heart for probably most of her life. How, you know, it doesn't say how long she had waited. A lot of times, like Hannah. Remember Hannah in the Bible before Samuel was born? She cried to God and she cried so hard that no words were coming out of her mouth. This is the power of a mom. You think moms aren't important? Moms birth greatness. Ladies, you have greatness in you and you birth greatness and you shouldn't back off or back up to anyone. God does great things through women. Many people, many of us are here because of our praying grandmas and mamas and people who fought for us. So here she is. The child dies. Her promise dies. Right in her arms. And you know what she does? She gets on that Apple iPhone and she starts complaining. But God, you misled me. God, this isn't how it's supposed to be. God, like, it's gone, it's done, there's no hope now. Why did you bring me out in the desert just to die?
Am I the only one who ever does that? But this wasn't the end either. This is more like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs when Snow White ate the poison apple instead of talking on it. And the elves are, or are they dwarfs? We're all sad. He said, my head, my head, she said. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. And the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother. And the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly in return. She called her husband. Her son just died in her arms. It's like, go, go, go um, get the car. Make sure it's got gas. I got to go find the man of God. That was her response. Now watch. This is really cool how, how God works. Where am I at? 23. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look. There's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Now listen. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? And do you know what her response was? No, I'm not all right. My husband's like broken hearted because he was in the, the child was in the field and he sent him in and he died. Not, he died in my arms and I'm not all right either. This is a promise you gave me and I told you not to mislead me. No, she didn't say that. Do you know what she said? Everything is all right. And when she reached the man and God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the, the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. And then she says, Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, Didn't I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. So here she's coming. She goes, Everything's all right. But then she's telling him, she's going like, look, I told you not to mislead me. I told you not to raise my hope. When all hell broke loose, literally, when everything looked like it was going under, do you know what God did? He, he gave her courage because she was not focusing on what had happened. She was focusing on the promise. She's saying, God, didn't you promise me? See, we put so much faith in our faith sometimes that it, faith itself can become an idol instead of putting our faith in Him, putting our faith in His promises because then it becomes dependent upon our faith. Remember the man who said, I believe that helped my unbelief? And Jesus said, I'm sorry, you don't have enough faith. And then heal him, right? No. He healed him anyway. Why? Because he didn't put his trust in his faith, but he put his, his faith in the trust of, of, of God, right? I'm going too long. I've got to hurry. I've got to pick a shorter story, right? And so, he said, when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi come over, push her away. The man of God said, leave her alone. She is bitter distressed. And then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. And Elijah said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff. Again, there's a staff. 
Watch this. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord live and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him the boy has not awakened. When Elijah reached the house, there was a boy lying dead on the couch. And he went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got up on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hand, and he stretched himself out upon him. And the boy's body grew warm. And then it says, Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. And the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Now this is in the Old Testament, right? This is before the cross. This was before Jesus. Remember, there was another girl that died in, in the New Testament. And Jesus had to kick everybody out of the room. And what did he do? He did the same thing. You know what it reminds me of is one day God took some dirt. And it was in the Garden of Eden. And he molded a man out of it. And he went, hey. And he breathed. And you know what happened? Adam man come to life. You know what? That was your birth too. The breath of God made in the image of God with His Spirit. It tells me this. Sometimes you can be thinking, oh, I just need, to, need the power of truth. I just need this. I just need that. But without the breath of a living God, it's hopeless, man. Thank God we have Him. And we have his breath. And we have his life. And we have his truth. And we have his hope. And we have all that he is for us in those situations. It says in Hebrews. I love this. Let me read that says in Hebrews chapter 11, 11, by faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand of the seashore. And then it says all these people were living by faith when they died. If you read the start of that verse, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then just up before that in chapter 10, verse 35, it says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. See, it's not about putting our faith in, in just what we do. It's not about our putting our faith in our faith, but it comes down to relationship. Do you trust what he says? Do you trust what God says? It just comes straight down to that. Above what we see, above what we hear, above our five senses, above our vast knowledge that's so much greater than God's himself. Do you trust him? 
because he's wanting to breathe some life into things. And I'm telling you, just watch. By this time next year, you'll be holding that in your hands. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.